We're going to look now at the first two readings. I'm doing it, I'm putting them into one section, skipping the psalm, so that we have more time to look at the gospel, which again, as last week, was quite long, 40 some odd verses. Um, this first text is First Samuel, and it's the text um, where Samuel goes to anoint a king to replace Saul. And uh, all God tells him is, fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I have chosen my king from among his sons. That's all Samuel knows. But you know, his name, Shmuel, means, you know, I, I listen to God, for God hears me both. Okay. So, off he goes, okay? Um, there's a line not in our text, which is begin when the Lord says to Samuel, how long are you going to mourn over Saul? We have work to do. Leave him to my mercy and let's go. So take your, your horn of oil, Valek, and I will send you to Jesse, Jesse uh, and so forth, uh, so that um, uh, because I have looked upon one of his sons to be a king for me, literally. Now you know the story, okay? Um, he gets there. Our, um, our reading skips sections. You might want to look at the text itself so that you get an idea. Yeah, they're thinking of time. And so they want to get the drift of the story. So they edit it. And um, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, so he goes over to Bethlehem. And they, what do you do? And here comes the prophet. So they're scared to death. What do we do wrong? I've just come to sacrifice, to join you. God told them to say that so that Saul wouldn't catch on that anything's going on. So he gets there and uh, he tells him, you know, that um, uh, Yahweh, the Lord, wants to uh, make a king. Uh, so it, they start. Samuel looks at Eliab, the oldest, and um, he's a handsome man, big man. And he's the oldest. Samuel looked at him and said to himself, Surely the Lord's anointed is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not judge from his appearance or from his lofty stature, because I have rejected him, meaning I just haven't chosen him. Not as man sees, as God sees. Because man sees the appearance, man sees the face, God sees the heart. Now, it's because of that theme that this text is here on this Sunday when we are reflecting on and, and meditating on uh, the gift of sight. We don't get it unless God gives it. We can see. He saw Elia, great big fellow, looks like a great warrior. He'd be a great king. And God said, no. You're looking at the face. Look at the lev. Look at the heart. So they bring all the sons there. You know the story. Except one. And Samuel was a little bit confused. You see, they ran out of sons. And the Lord hadn't said anything about any of them. Except, no, it's not that one. So he says to Jesse, do you have any other sons? Yes, I have one, the youngest. He's out watching the sheep. The youngest would get stuck with that job and everybody else is going to the banquet. Saul says, call him. We're not going to have any banquet until he shows up. So then, um, he, here he comes in now. He was ruddy, a youth, handsome to behold, and making a splendid appearance. That's the way that's translated. Uh, it's all right for us. What the Lord says, there, that's the one. Anoint that one. That's the one, you see, 
that I want. Samuel took the horn of oil in his hand, anointed David in the presence of his brothers, and from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David, stayed upon David. And uh, so the oil conferred the Spirit because of God's will. Okay. Now the reason is there is to remind us that we'll never get it unless God gives it. You can study till your eyeballs fall out. You're not going to know God personally, experientially, without surrendering your life and getting rid of vice. That's it. Now there are extraordinary graces given in our day. The baptism in the Holy Spirit came to many people who then, in the power of that, had to work out the kinks in their life. Give up drinking, give up immoderate sex, or, Ill, or unlawful, you know, immoral sex. Uh, give up fascination with money. Start to live a Christian life. And the power for that came from that experience of the reality and the majesty of Jesus Christ, which is the heart of a baptism in the Holy Spirit. As Pope Benedict said, and I've quoted it before, he wants the whole church baptized in the Holy Spirit and defines it as being aware, aware of what was given to us in baptism and confirmation, namely the Holy Spirit. So, we move on now to this uh, next text, which is a text of uh, light. It's Ephesians 5, and it's all about light. Okay? Um, it, it starts off by saying, I have nothing to do. Where is this going? Um, no, no. Uh, yeah, well, this is it here. Yeah. Um, you were at one time darkness. Now you're light in the Lord. Huh? Uh, now walk as children of the light. Now, you have there the famous thing that you find throughout the whole of the New Testament, the indicative and the imperative. You are, you know, light in the Lord, so walk like it. Live like it. Don't disgrace the Lord or yourself. You are light in the Lord. Move toward the light. God is light. Okay. Uh, now, uh, for the fruit of light is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And that's how Paul describes this light. Um, it is goodness, righteousness, and truth. Okay? Um, yeah, here it is. Okay. Uh, it's not a very good, excuse me, it's not a very good translation. Uh, light produces, yeah, that's true, but it's light is, and it works these things in us. Okay. Um, now, of course, I've lost my place. Um, let's see where I was. Here I am. That's the fruit. Why does he call it a fruit? Because you see, it's the maturing of a whole life process. Every spring, little bud, keep watching it pretty soon. By the end of the bud of fall, it's an apple. It's the fruit. But it starts. So you see, the Christian life is this growth. And it's a tragedy to stunt that growth. In fact, for those who are called to lead God's people, there are ways that it could be a sin to impede that growth. We owe it to the Lord and to God's people to grow up. That means we have to fight for it. And it does mean a total reassessment of the way that we live our pastoral practice. This is exhausting, but it's easy. This is not exhausting, but it's hard. And we prefer for the easy and the exhausting. Oh, I must be doing so much. I'm so tired. The Lord is saying, no, this is what I want. This is hard. You've got to die to sin. You've got to live to me. You've got to give up your sin. You have to fight for prayer time. You have to come 
whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. That's hard. Running around doing stuff, that's tiring, but it's easy. And that's why we get tricked. Oh, I'm, I'm exhausted myself. I must be doing great. And the Lord says, no. That's easy. When you, there's a story about this um, archbishop of, I think, Mexico City, when he had finally reached transforming union, was so taken over by the Lord. And whatever money was given to him for confirmations, he gave away. He would do sometimes 5,000 confirmations in a week. And never get tired. Because the Holy Spirit was moving, guiding, sustaining him. You try 5,000 confirmations a week, doing everything else at the same time. See how tired you get. But when we give our life to the Lord and he sustains us, it doesn't happen. Well, I better keep on going here. Um, So, you see, have nothing to do with the fruitless works of darkness. There's no fruit to that. Later on, he says, or in Romans, he says, you know, what, what have you got to show for all that immoral life? Nothing but embarrassment and guilt and fatigue, loneliness. You've got nothing to show for it. I never made you for that. Okay. And then what's done in secret, it, it's shameful to even talk about. Uh and so then, uh, what is con- you know, condemnable, you see, is manifest by the light. Um, you see, don't take part in them, expose them. For it's sh- shameful even to mention them, the things done by them in secret. But everything, now this is interesting, everything exposed by the light becomes visible. It won't be hidden. And there is a day of reckoning. God is not sloppy. He's not overlooking stuff like, oh, I, you know, I don't have time to deal with that. No. He overlooks it in mercy, hoping for our conversion. Um, and so, uh, the text, you know, goes on then uh, to speak of that um, and to teach us what it means to move from darkness to light. And it ends, the text ends with this uh, line, you know, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. How do we rise from the dead? We stop sinning. Now we can need help with this. You know, if you to have a real spiritual director means to have somebody who will say, that's darkness. Now let's pray together. You know? Spiritual, real spiritual director carries everybody he directs in his heart and prays for them all the time. He has to. He has to. And uh, his role is to show forth the truth, the mercy, and the gentleness of Christ. To bring people out of sin so that they move from this purgative way, you know, starting to get real into illuminative, knowing what we're talking about. And finally, union with God. This is not unattainable. Thousands, millions of people have been brought and allowed themselves to be brought into transforming union with God in this life. Millions. We just don't know them all. But that's the progress of light.